Good morning, Miranda, Mark, John, Good morning. Stacy. Good morning. Good Hi, morning. Good morning. Good to get started. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Stacy Green uh, with John Hancock. I'm the um, National Account VP that manages the symmetry relationship. And uh, I was invited on this morning um, to give you guys a quick update about where we are with John Hancock, as well as talk about the new agent portal that we just released. Um, which I know has been a long time coming and it's been something that uh, Symmetry has really been um, looking forward uh, to us being able um, to share. So I actually have a few slides I'm going to, um, I am going to share my screen um, quickly so you can take a look at a few things. I hope can everyone see my, see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Great. So um, I guess I just want to start in level set. This has been a really um, fast moving year for John Hancock. Um, you know, if we think about where we were last April when we took the stage at the Symmetry National Meeting, we had a term product, three durations, and we were going up to 250000 um, of space at, uh, for instant decision, instant issue. Well, today we now have um, term durations of 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years. We go up to 500,000 of face amount. Again, instant decision. Um, so no swab, no phone interview, absolutely nothing else comes into Hancock for us to make an underwriting decision. Um, we've uh, made our e-app uh, telesales enabled. Um, so you can now do it direct, face-to-face um, -face with your client or over the phone. We enhanced our website, which is the main website that you go to um, for everything, accessing the e-app, running quotes, marketing materials. Um, we launched an ROP rider that's now available on 25 and 30 year term. We put a new commission system in place and then, which brings us to today, which is the agent portal is the most recent thing that we launched, which we put in place on June 2nd. So I think we really now um, are really focused on what we can be doing to enhance your ability to manage your book of business and work, work with your clients. So the portal is going to do things like it's going to um, be the place that you go and pull commission statements from. It's where you're going to view your transactions ahead, even ahead of the payments being processed. Um, you'll be able to see your enforced policies, run pending lapse reports, be able to see agents that are contracted below you in your hierarchy, view their books of business. And then most recently, as of two weeks ago, we've now started um, sending emails out to the writing agent if a client has uh, missed a premium payment. So not only will you be able to manage that information on the portal, but we're going to proactively be sending you an email letting you know that you have a client that's missed the premium payment. So you have the ability to really be back in front of them um, to, to conserve the business. So I mentioned the enhanced website. That is um, www.jhsimpleterm.com. This is really um, the website that's going to house everything that you need um, to make a sale um, you know, with, with your client. Um, so you'll run quotes, access the e-app, it's training, marketing materials, and then the most recent thing that we've added, which you'll see circled on the screen, is this My Business tab, which is right next to where you launch your e-app. When you click on that, you'll see two options, log in and register. If you've already um, registered, you'll click the login and put in your username and password. If you haven't um, registered yet, you'll just select the, um, the register tab. And then this is what's going to come up on um, the screen for you. You'll simply choose whether um, commissions pay to you as an individual. So if we pay them to your social security number, or if we're paying commissions to an LLC or a business that you've set up. So you'll choose which one and then take your, you know, that will take you through the self registration process. You'll only be able to register for the portal if you are actually appointed with John Hancock. So if your appointment hasn't been processed with us, you won't be able to register and, and you'll get an error. So just be mindful of this opens up to you for registration once um, you are actively appointed, appointed with John Hancock. So this is um, what the agent portal um, home screen looks like. Um, so you'll see things like if you're an agent, your immediate upline um, agent will be no 
um, would be noted there. Um, you'll see how long um, you've had an appointment with John Hancock. This is really sort of the jumping off point. Um, you'll notice across the bar, there's an arrow for new client. If you're in the portal and want to get back to um, the www.jhsimpleterm website, that will take you back there. Um, so it's really pretty easy to toggle between, um, between both sites. Um, I'm going to highlight kind of a few of the key places I think you're going to want to go um, to get started. Um, but definitely, I recommend that you explore the portal a little bit. There is a ton of information um, that we're housing on it currently. So probably first and foremost, commissions is always a big, big spot um, and a big point of interest. So you'll see across the top where I'm circled commissions. When you click that, you get two drop downs. The first is commission history. If you click this, what's going to um, pop up is it's going to be a full transaction history of um, the commissions um, that are being processed. Now, this is a great spot to go. If you've been running appointments all week, you get to say, you know, Wednesday or Thursday. If you go into here, you'll be able to see the business that you wrote, um, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, kind of the days previously. Even though the commissions might not have paid out to you yet, you'll be able to see the transaction. You'll get to see what you're going to be, be paid on it. So that's a great place to, on the fly, be able to really quickly be looking at what's happening and what's coming your way from Hancock. If you click on commission statements, that's going to open up where you will put in the date range that you're looking for, and then you will get PDFs of all the commission statements that are in that date range that you can open up and will give you full, the full accounting for what the deposit is that's been made, uh, made to your bank account. Um, the, if you come in and click on the My Business, which is right first and foremost, that is going to show you every policy that you've written as an agent. So if you are in a hierarchy and aren't actually writing applications yourself, if you click on that, that's going to be blank. So just keep in mind that my business is purely for cases that you're, you're the agent um, taking the application. So if you go into that, that's going to be the spot that you'll be able to um, – Search by various policy status, you'll be able to do enforce, pending laps, not taken, um, you know, surrenders, laps. So you'll really be able to slice and dice your book of business. Um, you can drill into um, the specific policies, and then that will also allow you to drill into um, the client information and contact information um, for, uh, for your clients. If you click on across the top, you'll see where I have this My Downline button. That's going to give you the view of, if you click Find Downline, that's going to give you a list of every agent that's appointed below you. Um, you'll have the ability to compile the full list. If you go into Find Downline and there's a specific person that you're looking for, you can check. They're going to show up in your downline once they've been appointed. So great, you know, if you know you've got someone who's getting, um, you know, who's maybe in the process of appointed, this is a great way to check to see if they're completed or not. If you don't see them there, that means their appointment hasn't been um, completed yet with, with John Hancock. If you click on the Issue Business tab, this is going to be your view into your downlines business. So this will be all the cases that your, um, you know, agents that you're working um, and then in your downline that they've written, you'll be able to query that book of business the same way you can yours as a writing agent. So you can sort it by pending laps, you can sort it by recently issued. So it's just a great way for you to really be able to keep a pulse check on how your team's doing, um, you know, and if there's anything that you need to be mindful of or just wanting to have some additional conversa you know, conversations with, with your agents. Um, so that's kind of a quick spiel of, you know, of the portal, I would encourage you um, that, uh, you know, as you're in it, if there's things that you're wishing you could see in there that aren't there, please let us know. We already are, are, are working on our day two enhancement. Um, so we really want to keep on top of it. I know there's um, finding some of the client names has been a little bit tricky. So we're working to enhance that so we can make it much more, um, you know, easy for you guys to find the client names. We're also going to start loading in actual sales premium. So you'll have a, a better sense of what's being reported 
um, for sales numbers versus just commission, um, you know, the commission details. Um, so those are kind of two areas that we already are working on enhancements. Um, but if anything comes to mind, um, you know, that you'd like, wow, it'd be super helpful if you had this. We absolutely want to know about it. Um, it's been a long time for us getting to this point, but we really want this to be um, just an awesome site for you guys to leverage and really make it valuable to you, um, you know, in the field. Um, the last thing I'll mention before my time is up is on Monday, we are uh, moving to daily commission runs. So currently, we cycle our commissions one time a week. Starting on Monday, we will be cycling our commission daily. So what that means um, is that on Monday, if you write a policy before 7 p.m. on Monday, Hancock will release the commissions out on Wednesday. So we're going to be significantly um, decreasing the amount of days between commission payments. So the same will go if you write a policy on Tuesday before 7 o'clock, Hancock will release the funds on um, Thursday. So that you will see a notification from us um, on Monday with all the parameters uh, for that. And that's really all the, um, the kind of comments I have and what I wanted to run through. I don't know if there's opportunity for questions in this setting or, or not, but. Um, yeah, really quick, Stacy. sorry. Um, so just a couple of questions here. It looked like, uh, what was the website to register? And then I'll kind of go in order here. And then just if okay, I yeah, understand, sure. um, I cannot, not register to the site until I've written business with John Hancock. Is that correct? Um, so I think those so, are two kind of. The two? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so first you would go to www.jhsimpleterm.com. That website is open to everyone. That's where you access the e-app, run quotes, marketing materials, no username and password required for that. Um, to access the agent portal, that's the, that My Business tab that's right next to the Launch eApp. Um, you will can register for the agent portal once your appointment is in place with John Hancock. Um, so you, it doesn't matter if you've written business or not. Um, as long as you're appointed, that's what clears you to be able to come into the come into the agent portal. Now, if you haven't written any business, you know you might not have as much information sitting in that commissions piece. But if you manage a downline, you would certainly be able to view the agents below their book of business. You know, all all of that type of information. Okay, very good. Yeah, and then um, yeah, and then just to answer, I guess uh, how you get appointed with John Hancock, um, just reach out to your your upline. Um, and they can actually help you out with that. Um, let me see, is there anything else, Stacy? Is there a plan for more John Hancock products to be made available to SFG agents? Yes, we, um, we, we're definitely looking at what would be, um, you know, some, some additional product lines that we could offer. Uh, we really knew we wanted to get just the, the term product stood up. The ROP rider was one that we knew we needed to, um, you know, to get to market quickly. Uh, but now once with, especially with now having, um, you know, the daily commission cycle stood up on Monday, we are definitely going to be looking at what, what's the next, uh, you know, the next phase for us, what's some new products we could look at. So if you guys have ideas about products you'd like to see or, uh, you know, love, would love to hear, um, you know, specifically about what you think would work in the field from us. Okay. Yeah. And then I think just one last one. Um, is there like a 7 p.m. cutoff for the, the commissions? So if it was issued and approved, you know, by 7 p.m., does that deposit into their account the very next morning or is it the following day after that? So it's, so, um, yeah, so the commission, um, the commission cutoff is 7 p.m., all of our, um, our process is that uh, policy um, instant, so it's an instant decision um, and instant issue all at the same time. So if you sit with a client and you click the submit button at, you know, 645, you know, you would have your issue, you know, you would have your approval and issue all prior to 7 p.m. So as long as the case is um, written before 7 p.m., we are going to um, release the commissions on Wednesday. So it, Monday would be day one, Tuesday is day two, and then we release money on day three. Okay, very good. 
Very good. And then um, just one last one. Sorry. And then I'm up. Well, yeah. We got to probably roll and not take any more of your time. But uh, just as far as the return of premium, are we close to, is it 100% back with your return of premium products or uh, do you guys not offer that? Yeah. Yeah, so how our ROP works really quickly, um, so it is 75% return a premium at the end of the term duration on 25 and 30 year term. Where we're a little bit unique is that we will actually return premium along the way as well. So with our ROP, um, after year five, if the client surrenders, they will get a percent of their premium returned back to them. So after year five, what happens is you'll see it incrementally goes up each and every year until they hit the end of the term duration where they can get 75% back. Mm, okay, very good. So yeah, it's gonna be pretty pretty similar to American Amicable in, in which and way that they do it. So it'd be a good reference point for, for all of you to kind of understand there. Awesome stuff. Okay. Stacy. Hey. that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, thank you. I really appreciate all of your time. Have a great rest of your week. Good weekend and, and be well, everybody. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, and yeah, bye. let me just, uh, bye, Stacy. Let me just kind of kick bye. this over to, um, I don't know. I, I can honestly say just one of the most amazing human beings that I've ever met. You know, I've, I've known her for probably close to, I don't know, give or take 14 or 15 years. And We've, of course, gotten really close just over the past four, four and a half years. Um, and it, again, just to see how someone could start a business through the trials and tribulations that she had to go through uh, in going through a divorce, right? Being a single mom. And then just the, right, like, so there's, there's this hurricane going on around her. And then to talk about just struggling in this business because of all of the outside forces, right? And then she kind of came in here like, I am not a salesperson. I'm not a salesperson by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> right? And, and really had to kind of talk herself into the idea of like, all right, I'm not a salesperson, but you know what I can be? I can be an advisor. And so it took, I, I don't know the exact number, but I think over the course of five weeks, um, you know, sat with close to 50 families and, and really, I think, helped out one of them, one out of 50. And so... I don't That's know what we're going to be training on today, how to close another 50. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. You know, but, but then again, just kind of <laughs> being committed, right? Sticking, sticking with it. And, and, and then just to go on to be the number three um, agent in the entire country, the number one writing female agent in all of Symmetry uh, Financial Group back in 2016. Um, to then I, I could just go on and on and on about her accolades, you know um helping i don't know what she has now 11 i think maybe 10 or 11 uh, agency owners inside of her organization so helping 10 or 11 other people really build toward their dream to then you know going through a, a health crisis and then writing a book <laughs> like, this is wonder woman at its finest um one of my best friends i'm so grateful and thankful just to have you in my life and, and the impact that you've made on me and so many others. Uh, just want to introduce everyone to Miranda Martin. Or I'm going to kick wow, it John, I wasn't expecting that big introduction. <laughs> but thank you. And, and guys, I couldn't be more excited to, to be up doing this call and looking around. And I'm like, I'm surrounded by elite producers right now. <laughs> I'm looking around Mark Nadeau, agency owner, elite producer, uh, one of the most consistent agencies and, um, and producers on my team. We got Dave Kushner, who I know you guys have probably heard of a bajillion times, been number three, was it maybe number two, Dave, for the last three years in a row. This guy averages thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a month, every single month for the last 36 months in a row. Like what in the, wow. <laughs> and the year that I was um, the top female, John actually was number one in the whole company. The guy put up like 600 grand with, with uh, like his rookie year and his only year in the field. So um, after that, we kind of linked arms and said, let's go hit the top of the company together. And, and it was all of, you know, these guys and a lot more that we just, we just said, we're doing this. So Guys, I couldn't be more um, honored to share the stage with the caliber uh, that you guys bring to the table. And um, I know that it was really on our hearts to, to meet with you guys and share 
not only like the sales presentation, but we really wanted to to go to kind of that second level, right? We, I know, I think everyone on the line um, who's been in front of people probably has that first level that the, you know, the nuts and bolts on just kind of how to make it through that in-home presentation. And I remember back to when I was new, I was scared when people had like all this coverage and I heard about it on the phone, like I was kind of nervous to meet with them or when they were like super like old in years and um, maybe they had a big mortgage. I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to make like a five or six um, thousand dollar policy sound good to these guys, you know, and um, one of the things actually learning from the people that we have on the line today, when I really learned how to uncover the problem and really understood when I sat with a client, like, okay, they, now I know their bills, right? And now I know how, like what their bills are. I know what's coming into the home, but how do I make sense of it all? Right. And it really wasn't until I think John, I remember you really, um, a training that you were doing for the master one day really connected the dots. And at that point, it didn't matter if these people had like a million dollars of life insurance or, you know, whatever, like it was all stuff money that we could spend that was out already out the door. And so today we're going to be really, um, giving you guys that second level of, of, um, like knowledge on how to diagnose this problem so that you guys can really connect the dots for your client. Um, but I'd like to hand it over to um, one of my favorite guardians, um, he, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mark Nadeau. <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. <laughs> so, yes, I, I am an ultimate guardian. I'll admit it. <laughs> the engineering background doesn't 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 help at all in that regard. So, yeah, I get like my, I like my detail. So. Uh, thank you. So it's an honor. It's it's a it's a privilege to be part of your master agency, Miranda. I just want to, you know, thank I'm just you. honored to have uh, you as an upline. And I've learned so much running side by side with people like Dave Kushner and, you know, John, we've been buddies for a long, long time. So so it's really an honor and a privilege to be on this call. Um, uh, the, the goal when we were looking at the call was to provide continuity um, and continuity in that um, Justin Finney on a couple of calls has done a brilliant job of simplifying the, um, the fact finding, the, the, the fire drill, whatever you, you call it, right? So really finding out where people are in their lives. And what we learned in doing a lot of trial and error on telesales is that we could no longer do a detailed itemized list. Like when we're at the kitchen table, we've got their attention. Um, they, they, can't, they can't get away from us. And I don't want to say that, you know, we're, but we're sitting in, in their home, right? So we can do an itemized list and we have their attention. What we found in telesales is that people can drift easily and they may not have the attention span. So we've already had already started to shrink that down. And Justin's call was just absolute brilliance in his uh, ability to use that, that circle. Right. And so, you know, very quickly in Justin's fact finding, um, he did kind of this lump logic to show the high level problem. And where we want to go today is what happens if there isn't a problem? What happens mm -hmm. if you do that fact finding and whether you're doing, you know, more full or partial coverage, you know, you've got someone that's healthier or in their, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or you've got someone that's older and may have health issues. Um, what happens if they're not seeing the problem? What, what do we do then? And we really wanted to enlist, you know, some amazing people like John Ziller and Dave Kushner to tackle, you know, each one of those. So just as a, a setup for that, just a, a little recap of, um, of what uh, Justin had done in his fact finding, he really started with uh, having people understand that the biggest expense in their life is inaction, right? Procrastination, just as a very quick recap. And then he recommends that you tell a story, either a story that will resonate with a family with young kids talking about not having a will and what can happen if something happens or choosing maybe a different story, someone that's, you know, heading into retirement and the markets have been going up and up and up for 10 years and all of a sudden they drop. And then Justin reminds us right in there that there are little mistakes in life and there are big mistakes and it really closes the door on that inaction and saying, uh, you know, um, that our role is to help people uh, with what's important to them and help them get things done. And he recommends you let them bake on that for a few seconds. So very quick recap. After he does that, he goes into the stick man um, fact find. And what I love about that fact find is that it's interactive. We use it in telesales. I do 100% of my business now telesales. So you have them grab a piece of paper. 
you have them draw something. They're following your lead and instruction. And again, what he does, and I love the simplicity of it, says have them draw like a baseball size circle, right, uh, on their paper. And just think about your major bills. Think about your mortgage, your electric, your car, your insurance. Think about student loans, credit cards. Think about groceries and think about all those things that make up the household budget. Conservatively thinking here, what would be a number? What does it take to run the ship every month in your household? And people have a pretty good grasp of what it costs them every month and come up with that number very quickly. And then what he has you do is draw a stick man draw a stick man, you know, for, for you, Bob, and draw a stick man for you, Betty, with a little skirt on it. And, um, and you know, <laughs> he asks how much income is coming in from each side. So, Bob, if something happened to you, what would be that monthly income missing going into that circle? And, Betty, you know, what, what would it be from your side? And so, there are numbers that come from that. So, now we have what it costs for the bills. Now, we have the income being contributed by both, right? Then you would, um, you would ask on the nest egg side, right? If, you know, the checkings account, um, you know, is it a, is anything meaningful or is it a, just a rolling month to month balance? And I love that line of questioning that was, you know, created there by John Ziller. It's such a soft, soft way to find out what they would have to fall back on. The savings account, same question, anything meaningful or month, rolling month to month balance? How about any one 401k money? How about any IRA money or any annuities? So you're getting, a real clear picture of what their, um, what their burn rate is, what they're bringing in against that burn rate, and then what the assets are that they can fall back on, which you can use to uncover addi additional opportunities. And then you get the equity in the home, and that is really the, the setup now. And, it, and in the ideal world, they, they look at that and they go, oh my God, if something happened to, to Betty, I'd be screwed. Please sell me insurance. You know, sign me up right now. In the real world, it doesn't always go that way. In the real world, they'll say, well, hey, you know, I've got this policy. This could mm -hmm. pay for things, right? There's different scenarios they can come up with. So what I'd like to do is just hand it over to John. We have a scenario we'd like to walk through oh. where they've got term, I'm One sorry. Thing. Yeah, um, before we hand it to John, I just wanted, and, and Mark, you did a great job. And, and again, the Justin Finney call, how long ago was that, Mark? If people wanted to go back and listen to it? Probably about three weeks ago. And it was right on Thursday. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe we can actually have someone post it in the, the sidebar because it was awesome. Um, really, what we're going to do today, guys, is we're going to take you down two paths, okay? Um, path A is really um, the younger person, the person that um, maybe is healthy, um, they're under 65-ish. This is someone that we're, after the booking call, we know that we're probably going to be showing them a full or partial payout. You know, John Ziller, he's going to take that one <laughs> and show us what to happen if the people really don't think there's a problem, okay? And then we got Dave Kushner. Um, we're going to have him take path B. So this is when we know that the folks are older in age or they have some serious health problems. Uh, one of the things that we always look for, because sometimes I'm not sure which, which way should I go here. And really, when I source out my options, I try to find a solution that's around 10% of their mortgage payment. So if it's a thousand dollar mortgage payment, I'm going to try to find a solution that's like around a hundred bucks. And typically when I'm starting to just price these three out, that'll really tell me where I should go. If, if the full mortgage payout is going to be 800 bucks, you know, we're not going to go that way. Right. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to show you right now, we're going to go down path A and then immediately after that, we're going to toggle and we're going to go down path B. So without any further ado, uh, we'll pass it over to the wild man himself. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> um, guys, first and foremost, I'm John Ziller, direct to Carl Miller, uh, direct to Symmetry Financial Group under the Carl Miller, Ryan Miller, Rob Puckett, Marshall Whalen. Hi, rookie. So grateful to be here. Um, yeah, you know, again, just thinking about this, like I struggled in the very beginning, and that's why I absolutely love, again, whatever you guys want to call it, the, the I've heard different forms of it right the financial fire drill I've heard the fact finding I think I called it the fact finding but anyway whatever you want to call it doesn't matter but really just kind of digging into the nuances of their finances so we can understand um, but more importantly it's like I can remember so many times too just walking into a home where a family had a million dollars in in coverage right and I was so afraid of that 
Um, because my brain logically, all right, you got a, you know, $300,000 home, you got a million dollars in coverage, just use the million dollars to pay off the 300,000. Now you got $700,000 left, right? Um, and <laughs> then you so can just I, leave. You don't even need to worry about doing the presentation. Okay. They're good. Don't go. Right, exactly. <laughs> Brenda, you're covered. Thanks. Bye. You know, I mean, <laughs> like there was just this insurmountable level of anxiety that, that, that kind of overcame me, um, when hearing that. And so one of the biggest things that I've realized is that, um, you know, it, I don't care what they have because what, whatever they went out and got, there was a reason for it. And so I truly believe our perception is going to turn into our reality. If we're afraid of it, we're going to get it right. Um, so the way I look at it, you know, now, I, or the way that I would encourage all of you to look at it is that if they have a policy, awesome. Why awesome? Because they understand the importance of life insurance and they don't mind buying an additional, right? Or if they don't have any at all, awesome, because they really, really, really need it. And now I get to educate them on it, right? And so I, it doesn't matter what they have or how much they have. There was a reason that they went out and got that particular amount, or if they don't have any at all, amazing, right? Because now we get to educate them. So just that optimistic approach, even each and every time, um, you know, you don't have to really get into defending and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but, uh, but yeah, Mer, why don't we go ahead, um, and we're just going to pull up the graph, right, to where we can just dive right into it. I'm not going to run through the whole scenario, correct? No, let's just pretend, so John's already at the point where he's gone through all this with Bob and Betty. I'll be Betty, maybe Dave, you could be Bob, we can be, uh, um, take a new role here. Perfect. <laughs> I'll change right. my name just so no one gets confused. <laughs> so. okay. And then I am going to minimize. All right, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so we already have the financial, um, you know, fact finding again, whatever, whatever you want to call it there. And so here are kind of the numbers that have been laid out to us. Now, how do we help you guys understand what to do with these numbers and what types of questions to ask? So um, here's just kind of a, 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 of a format that I've done. And again, it's really playing with numbers just to kind of understand it, right? And so if Betty's making $8,000 a month and Bob is making $3,000 a month, our initial instinct is we have to make sure that there's coverage on Betty, right? And so how do we get them to see that? Because in this particular scenario, I don't think we actually have the life insurance up here uh, anywhere, which is okay. I'll put um, it, how much life insurance do these guys have? Let's just say $500,000. Okay. Okay. Again, the, the number doesn't even, it could be, yeah, just put 500,000. Okay. Okay. And so again, to, to the, the untrained eye, a $500,000 life insurance policy when we're looking at this, we could easily say, or Betty could easily say, I have $500,000 in coverage. I'll just use that money to pay off my mortgage. Boom, right? And Betty, you're correct. You can use that money to pay off your mortgage, but let's really kind of pay attention to how that would look if they just so happen to do that, right? Um, so just kind of looking at it is if we had the $500,000 um, and we used it to pay off their mortgage. Now, again, these numbers, hopefully, if, if I go too fast, Miranda, kind of slow me down just to make sure that everyone's kind of understanding this. But we use the $500,000 to take care of their mortgage. What does that mean? $500,000 minus $325,000 leaves us with $175,000 left over. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so now how does that play out? Well, you don't have the full $175,000, do you? No, why? Because there's going to be some final expense money, right? Funeral and, and things of that nature. And so you can go ahead, and Miranda, and deduct however much you think your final expenses would be. All right, $30,000, perfect. It could be 10, it could be 15, it could be 20, whatever the number they tell you, write it down and move on. Miranda wants an awesome funeral. That's why it's going to be $30,000, right? Okay, so perfect, that's fine. Um, so now we're left with roughly, after the final expense, about $145,000, right? Uh -huh. Okay, 
So now here's, here's again, here's where it kind of gets into the weeds a little bit, but I hope you guys can kind of keep up with me. So if we look at their overall bills at roughly $7,500 and we deduct the mortgage of 2,200. Now that includes, hold on, that includes their taxes and, and all the other stuff. So let's say that the taxes are roughly, it doesn't matter. Let's just say that we'll keep the numbers really simple. Let's just say their taxes are only 200 bucks a month. You'd probably be living in Kentucky if your taxes were only 200 bucks a month, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and I'm not picking on Kentucky by any stretch of the imagination. It's just our taxes out here are so terrible, Dave, aren't they? Um, so anyway, so let's just say that we're really eliminating roughly $2,000 uh, from the actual mortgage payment. So if you take the 7,500 on their total bills, we eliminate their mortgage because they're still gonna have to pay their taxes, which is going to equate to about $5,500 in totality. So that means even though we've eliminated their mortgage, if something, that means that they still need roughly $5,500 a month to cover their bills, okay? Um, is everyone kind of tracking with me so far or yeah, Dave. All right. This is all kind of making sense so far. Good. Okay. So now what we do is if we take, let's just say that something happened to Betty. If we take Bob's income of $3,000. Okay. And we put it into the 5,500 that they need. That means that their upside Bob would be upside down $2,500 a month. Okay, so mm -hmm. what does this mean? $2,500 a month times 12 months equals $30,000. And then that would kind of be red, right, Mer? Because that's yeah. how much we're upside down, which is okay. But, but hopefully everyone, yep, everyone's getting a drift. Oh no, what happened? There we go. It's okay. And that's each year, right? Just with, if it can, assuming Bob can keep working. Correct. Yeah. And we're, we'll get into all of that too here in just a second. But yeah, so $30,000 is what Bob is upside down every single month. How many times does 30,000 go into 145,000? Roughly five years. Mm. So then that, that points to a question, Miranda, right? is that understanding that if God forbid you didn't make it home, you guys have a four-year-old, you have a seven-year-old, you have you know Bryce, you have Grace, um, that leaves Bob upside down $2,500 a month. So if you pay off the mortgage of $325,000, you're only leaving Bob with about $175,000. And with the way that you guys have everything set up, he's upside down roughly 2,500 bucks a month that equates to $30,000 a year, we're gonna have less than five years. So let's just call it four years. There's no emergency money in there, right? There's, there's, there's no extracurricular activities in baseball and golf and soccer and fun, right? And living life and enjoying experiences and no buying cars. Uh, we're not equating to if the air conditioner goes out, the roof goes out, or you know, you need a new roof, or you need to buy some new appliances, new TV. Like this is just standard living over the next four years. So after that four-year period of time, Bob, what would you do looking at this scenario if you guys use the five hundred thousand dollars to pay off the mortgage? Mm. And then Bob would say, well, we would have to move. You would have to because you would not afford to be able to stay here. And then we're, we're going to have to, you know, again. So, so it's, a, it's a rabbit hole. And if you ask most people, especially that are younger with a four-year-old and seven-year-old, like when you kind of digging into their why, if you ask them like, hey, you know, if you had to drop the ideal situation, how would you want to leave your family? Most people are going to say, I want to make sure that there's enough money for college tuition. I want to make sure that, you know, they can buy a car, set them up. Uh, I want to make sure that my wife doesn't have to work for 10 years or my husband doesn't have to work for 10 years, blah, 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 blah. They're going to give you this big one. And then you'll be able to use kind of a lot of that into this analysis, so to speak. Um, so that's just kind of one way if that, you know, the, the turd says, well, I'll just use that to pay off, you know, my, uh, my house. <laughs> 
And I say turd because that wasn't the original intention when they pulled that policy out on themselves. And you can even ask them, you know, on that $500,000, Miranda, like, what was your original intention on pull, pulling that policy out, out on yourself? Most people say, I just got it to make sure that people were taken care of. Oh, so you got it for income replacement then, correct? Yeah. Okay, good. Now we'll use that income replacement analogy. All right. And it's the exact same thing. So if you use it for quote unquote income replacement, you got $8,000 a month that Betty is making. You take 8,000 a month times 12 months equates to what, Miranda, $96,000 over the course of a year. 96,000 a year over a five year period of time, that leads you with $480,000, right? And with your $30,000 funeral expense, uh, which is insane. But again, $30,000 funeral expense, right? Like you're only left with same thing. You're left with about four years. Now you're even in a bigger mess because you don't have a mortgage paid off and now you have $7,500 worth of bills. Bob, what do you do, <laughs> right? Because after that four year period of time, you're now, now you're upside down $4,500 a month. So what does that work-life balance look like? Because you're gonna have to go and make an extra $4,500 a month which ultimately means an additional job. Who gets the kids to and from school? Do you make their sporting events? Are they able to go out and, and enjoy their life and playing baseball, softball, ballet, soccer, right? Blah, 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 blah. And again, I could, I, I could sit here and talk about this for another hour, but I think that those are just two really basic kind of scenarios that you could easily just put right back into them and just ask them. So did a lot of those numbers make sense, Miranda? Again, I don't want to take up too much time just on this particular topic because I know that Dave's going to get into some awesome stuff. But again, if we just take their, their income, times it by 12, roll it into that and just ask them, look, now you're upside down and you still have the full amount of the bills, right? So if I can, as a, as a high level recap, right, of the tech, I call it a technique. These are all techniques that we can all learn, right? And you have to practice them. What John's doing is spending their money. He's basically showing them the math, right? That says, look, if you make this much and this is your expenses, even if the mortgage is paid off, you still have expenses that exceed your income. When you add that, that shortage, what happens when, when, when whatever money you have left over, what happens when that burns out? Mm -hmm. What happens when that's gone? That's right. And that's how he's getting to that, that question that has them really looking at their reality. That's, yeah. finding, that's finding the problem. Brilliant. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly right, Mark. It's spot on 100%. And again, just don't be afraid to kind of attack this, guys. We have to understand that 91%, 91% of Americans either don't have enough coverage in place or they don't have any coverage at all. So what does that tell me? That tells me that Nine out of 10 families that I sit with need exactly what we offer. We just have to help them see it. And this is a very simple way that we can help them see it. And again, just like Mark said, you got to practice it to really be able to understand the numbers. Um, but, and again, too, like realistically, okay, just one other kind of tidbit or point here is that their bills are, and this is something that you guys can kind of pay attention to. If you look at their checking savings, 401k, IRA, mm -hmm. Um, their savings account only has $5,000 in it. Bob and Betty make a total of $11,000. That means that, um, wh what's that math there? That's $3,500 a month that they have extra. $3,500 a month over a 10 month period of time should be $35,000 in there, not five grand. So what does that really tell me? That tells me that they spend a heck of a lot more than $7,500 a month, that they enjoy life. Right, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we can even lean on that a little bit too and say, look guys, you know, nothing from nothing, you have left over roughly 3,500 bucks a month and you have about $5,000 in your savings account. That really means that we spend above and beyond that $7,500. So if God forbid something happens, your lifestyle is going to dramatically change if we don't do something about it. You know, and so again, there's so many different ways that you guys can play with these numbers, but just understanding, I think just two directions that you can take it and really kind of paying attention to these numbers. You're not calling them out on it. You're just asking questions, right? Like it's, it's not like a, Hey, Mark, 
look at this man, 500 grand, 325, you got 175,000 left over. How long does that last you? <laughs> it's like, whoa, right? We're, we're just simply kind of enlightening them and, and just with our, our simplistic and casual kind of approach, it's like, here's kind of what I see. Do you guys see that too? All right, yeah. All right, so what do you do after that four year period of time? Okay, so again, I, I, I had a, a really good question come in and I think we should answer it. Yeah. Um, let's pretend that um, I'm going to change the game here. Let me erase the screen just because. Um, Miranda, Miranda, before that, just to tie up what sure. John said really briefly, because it was just brilliant, John, was a question about the purpose of the policy that they already had. What, what, what was Good. the purpose? So you heard John ask, you know, Bill and Mary, when you got that $500,000 policy back in the day, what was the purpose of that policy? Was it for income replacement? Was it for going on vacations and, and going to the dentist and sending the kids to school? Nine, 99 out of 100% of people will agree that the purpose of the policy when they first got it was income replacement. They'll confess to you that the purpose of the policy was not to pay off the mortgage in the first place. So I really love that, John. And I think that that would be a great first question. So to, to, to say that first and ask them what the purpose of the policy was, make a suggestion that it's for income replacement. Was it for income replacement? Give a few ideas what that means uh, so they can maintain a great lifestyle over the years. They're going to agree with that. If they don't agree with that, then, then this is gonna be even more valuable to go down this. Uh, but many times, John, I find that uh, it's off the table, you know, by their yeah. telling me that wasn't the purpose of it. Yeah, you get to nip it in the bud right away. Um, honestly, it is like, I, I always kind of did a little, it's the same exact thing, Dave. It was just a two part thing. Hey, what was the original intention when you pulled that policy out on yourself? They always say, I just wanted to make sure the family is okay. Oh, right. okay, so you got the income replacement then, correct? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Good. 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 And then now we get to just you use that as leverage. It's crazy, guys. Like people compartmentalize coverage all the time. Do you have a final expense policy? No, but they have a life insurance policy, right? Well, they have a final expense policy. It's just it's weird how they get to compartmentalize it. So we can compartmentalize life insurance. We can compartmentalize mortgage protection. We can compartmentalize final expense. It's just brilliant. So yeah, income replacement is perfect. It serves a purpose. Their coverage already serves a purpose. So yeah, good good stuff, Dave. Um, go ahead, Mer. What so was the question, and I think this is worth talking about really quickly before we got toggle to Dave here. Let's pretend that Bob brings in ten grand a month. Betty doesn't bring in anything. She's the homemaker. Um, you know, why would it make sense to get a policy on Betty? You know, for example, um, you know, Bob may think he's got everything covered. Um, type of thing. Yeah. And yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. It, it is, and it's so, I mean, it's so simple. And I'd love to hear from, uh, just so I'm not hogging all the, all the time here, but I'd love to hear from either you, Mer, and then I definitely have a piggyback uh, on the directions I could take it. Or you, Mark, or you, Dave, go ahead. Any any one of you guys just jump in on, on this. Mark, you want to take this one? <clears throat> You're smiling. I know you got a good thing to say. Yeah. So if Bob has all the money and Betty has zero, um, what was the question again, Miranda? Um, what would we, why would we want a policy on Betty? Because he might think he's got everything covered without Betty here. She takes care of the two kids and, you know, he's the one bringing in the money. So her life is going to change. You know, no, I'd she dies. Betty. Betty's out of the picture. Betty passed away. She got so in the car Bob's, Bob's life is going to change. Your lifestyle is going to change, right? So what are you going to be doing all the weekends? Do you want to be spending your weekends, you know, doing chores, cleaning house, following up after the kids, doing that all that yourself? Or do you think that you might actually get some help, someone to help you out, and it, your cost of living is actually going to increase without Betty? So if you want to be able to maintain the same lifestyles you have now with the income that you have now, it's not just the loss of Betty's income. She has no, it's the loss of Betty's life and everything that she contributes to the household. So wouldn't it make sense to have a cushion to fall back on to be able to cover all the increased costs of living that you're going to be incurring so that you don't have to dip into the savings or you don't have to choose dip into savings or change my lifestyle? I saw an article and I love sharing this and the wives love it, that, um, that like if you were to have to pay someone to be a housemaker, that it would be a salary of $90,000 a year. 
And as soon as you say that, you see the wife's eyes light up and you just added so much value to what she brings to the table type right. of thing. You know, I was fearful to put a price to it. I know, I do. <laughs> I'm not scared about just, you know, it's from an article, whatever. Um, Dave, what would you do there? Well, if, if they're young and healthy, I would talk about living benefits, perhaps. Um, I would talk about, you know, if, if, if Betty passed away, it would likely be uh, because of a health issue, right? And if that, God forbid, happened to uh, John, um, you know, what would look, life look like for him if he was on uh, a chemo? So I would, I, personally, I would tell a story of someone that uh, uh, was a single person, uh, they were healthy, and they, they, all they had was life insurance. And I would go into the talking about uh, living benefits, not just a death benefit, something that he can use. If, if something happened to him, that would be one angle. Um, oh. I, would be, I would be careful that I wouldn't want to come across as a salesperson trying to convince them to do something for Betty um, if they felt very strongly that she's okay. So I would want to make sure I'm not like a, putting a salesperson's cap on trying to convince them because I can lose that relationship if they feel I'm not an, a good advisor, you know, and, uh, and, and so, um, uh, but yeah, so for, for me, it's, it's about them of what's important for him. And I love what you're talking about that life changes, Mark, that uh, there are, uh, you know, additional bills, there's, uh, and then the health issues, I would go the, uh, the, the living benefits route. And I think that's something that we need to as agents remember with young and healthy folks, on the telephone, again, going back to setting the appointment, what living benefits are, but in these situations also, uh, you know, that we're talking about. Many times I'll just forget to talk about living benefits and move on. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah, that's good, that's good. A again, I mean, unless for that example, right? If, does Bob work from eight, you know, 8 a.m. To, to 2.45, right? While his kids are in school or, you know, how, how, who gets the kids to school? Or to and from school, um, are you able to make every single sporting event, or are you going to have to play? You know the the I don't know what it's called the where they they ride share right um, in between parents and each parents kind of take a turn. Um, you know juggling a genuine schedule, and then that's if you know they're in school. What what about when they're out of school? You know it's like who how does how does the work life balance you know mm -hmm. really look? I, how do you have that kind of intentional time with them? And so. What this could do is this, you could just have the ability to really be able to hire some additional help, mm -hmm. you know, again, because it's the same scenario. Say Bob makes 10 grand, they got 7,500 in bills. They only have $5,000 in their savings account. That's nothing, you know? I don't, I, don't, I don't say that disrespectfully or ignorant, but it's just, it's not a lot. That means that they spend a heck of a lot more. Um, and so they're go he's going to need some help. Mm -hmm. um, he's gonna, and so just, just by, you know, um, even, you know, say it's, it's half the mortgage, you know, if you didn't have to work as hard and it relieves, you know, some of the bills, does that help you? Or you can spin it into putting a policy on her. And if you, if you, Bob, didn't have a mortgage payment, would you have to grind it out as much at work? Or would that give you the ability to be able to kind of pull back a little bit, maybe get a different job to custom tailor your lifestyle to ensure that your kids' lives aren't totally disrupted, you know, from, from losing mom. You know, because if it's not bad enough, they're now that now not only did they just lose mom, but now they're going to lose dad because dad really has to kind of you know, pump in, kind of grind it out. He's not going to be there for anything. Mom was always there for everything. Don't you want to be present? Don't you want to be available? Right. And so you can really kind of dig in and find out what he does for work um, and really kind of figure out what those hours look like. And then just start kind of asking questions to that because anybody that's making 120 grand a year, they're typically working. 50, 60, 70 hours, you know, a week, that's not going to give them the ability to truly be present There's, when the kids are going to need them more than anything. Go ahead, Mer. There was a post that said, um, someone looked it up, salary for a stay-at-home mom is worth 162000 now. Yeah. Right, right. So. Exactly. It's a lot. And guys, yeah. someone asked if what if they don't have kids at home? Like the line of questioning that that Dave and um, Mark and and John just did. Like you may ask these questions, and there's not a big problem. You know, this isn't going to be the right solution for everyone. So if, if John were to ask the same line of questionings, like well, how would your life change if Betty wasn't here, and, and and he's okay, that's great. You know, in that situation, people either do this because it's a luxury or a necessity. 
And when I see that it's an, a luxury, I like, John actually taught me this to say, wow, that, this sounds like a, a, a luxury for you. And they go, people that can afford luxuries like having luxuries. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just drawing that correlation, man, you don't really need this. would be a luxury. Sometimes they're like, yeah, I want the luxury. Sign me up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so. it, it is. It's crazy. And they, in, in, you no longer look like a salesperson in their mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. You're saying, look, I don't know if you really need this. Like, it, this is more of a luxury. I see that you kind of have all these aspects covered, and then boom, go back to Dave Kushner. What he kind of said there is, if you have a single person, you know, with without a family, and they're young enough and healthy enough, you can tie it in. Like, gosh, you know what, Bob? Like, let me ask you something, man. Like, I see everything kind of looks really good. The only thing that that's really kind of missing here for you. Um, is that I wouldn't want you to put good money after bad. Here's what I mean when I say that. It's like, I don't want you having to pull out of your 401k if you have a heart attack. You know, if you had a stroke, if you got diagnosed with cancer, if you, um, you know, you got into, you're on your way to work and you got into a really bad accident, you were up and out of work for six or eight months. Like, you know, who, who pays your bills? You know, how, how does that kind of play out? What does that look like for you? So I might just recommend a policy that what it would do is, you know, some sort of either critical illness, right, or disability, blah, 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 that might just replace one year's worth of income. That's the only thing I see that's kind of missing, but everything else you're covered, man. You, you guys are, you guys did good, and I'm so proud of you for that. And then boom, now they're open to the idea because I'm not trying to slam something down their throat and really mentioning that it is a necessity. I can't tell you how many policies I've sold that way under that scenario, right? There are some variables here, but, uh, but yeah, good, good stuff, good questions. Back to you, All right. So guys, now we are going to toggle over um, to the second part that we talked about at the start. So we're going down path B. Um, let me pull it up. My computer is, there we go. So now we're going to toggle over to path B, guys. This is the folks that are perhaps a little bit older in age. They've got some health issues. And quite frankly, um, you know, I'm down in Florida, I would say about 90% of the sales that are made down here um, are about are, are this product. And when we were talking in groups here over the last week, it's anywhere between 60 to 70% of overall sales at Symmetry, I think are this product. And um, what we find is a lot of times the equity that a family has in their home is really their biggest asset. Right. So maybe they've got that five thousand dollars in savings and that 20 grand in their IRA. But the, the equity, the difference of what they owe now and what the house is worth, that's the biggest legacy that they're going to leave. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Super Dave uh, Kushner to, to knock this one down. Thanks, Miranda. Uh, Dave Kushner, direct to you, the great Miranda Martin. <laughs> okay. And uh, or Betty. Betty. <laughs> Betty. <laughs> Betty. And uh, John Ziller, love you, brother, and Mark Nadeau. If it wasn't for you folks, um, I wouldn't have uh, perhaps made it or done as well. So I just want to say that for the record. In my first year, John and Miranda, I listened to you two from the beginning. So, you know, I don't feel like I have to even say anything. I don't even have to say anything here. I, I'm just loving learning from you. Well, you guys. Um, a couple of notes that I, I wrote down just as far as thoughts. I'm sure there's a lot of some new, new agents on the line really basic treat people like they're your family your mom and dad treat them like they're your mom and dad have that mindset that you're helping them and or if they're your brother and sister that you're helping them and you're problem solving so i've always when i go in and help a family that's my mindset i'm not trying to get a commission or something like that um, my thoughts are with older folks um, or folks with health issues that they they know they're older they know they have health issues they know that the cost of insurance will will go up a little bit uh, as we age, I, I just want you to write down, and I hope you're all writing down a whole, everything that John, Miranda, and Mark talked about, um, but they want protection. So they want protection. That's why they set an appointment with you. That's why they filled out the form, and that's why they met with you. They want the protection. So it's a mindset that they want help rather than your thought that they may not or they may not see value. Uh, they set the appointment, so they, they have a need. They, they there's a problem there. Um, so just have that mindset. An another one is that they may, they're probably worried a little bit. They've had a conversation maybe about the cost of it or the potential costs if they're 70 years old and they have health issues. Uh, you know, they may feel it might be like another mortgage payment. So they're a little worried about that. So the critical period, the critical period concept as we go through it, 
Um, there are smaller uh, programs, $80, $100 a month, $125 a month. Um, they're just, they're so grateful when you come up with a solution that's affordable for them because oftentimes they uh, uh, thought to themselves about it may be cost prohibitive to, to, to have a mortgage uh, protection policy. So uh, that's the second point. And then the third one is that they don't have a plan. So most people don't have a plan for what happens when they lose their spouse. They don't like to talk about it. They've never given it thought. And so, um, you know, they want to have a plan and we're going to give them a plan and a path so that Betty, when, if John passes before Betty, Betty has a plan that she's going to execute. So, so she's going to, you know, we talk about that nest egg and that most valuable nest egg often is our home, the equity in our home. So we're going to set Betty up um, or, or John um, with the equity and, and giving them a plan so she can look up uh, you know, after the funeral and say, thank you, sweetheart, for the plan that you put in place. I now know I have a year of mortgage payments, what have you, and we're going to execute this plan, honey, for these reasons, opposed to no plan, where she comes home from the funeral and the bills are coming in and the mortgage is due and she's, you know, it's her first months without her husband and that panic and worry and stress and all. So as an agent, I, I see it that most people don't have a plan and my purpose is to help them recognize the value of the plan that we have for them. So um, the beginning of it, uh, does anybody have any questions on that? No, just We're keep good. going. Okay. Yeah. So, so getting the equity. Um, so it's so important that you get the equity that they feel that they have in their home right now uh, as a senior or, or someone that has health issues. If someone has significant health issues, uh, their end of life may be nearer than further away. So the equity and the equity protection is going to be just as valuable for someone that's 43 with congestive heart failure if there's uh, uh, equity in the home. So it's very important that you get their equity, um, not only what it is today, but what their equity would be in the future. So five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, um, it, that number is going to be much larger than what it is today. So as a young agent, I, when John and Miranda first explained this to me three years ago, I would just get the equity of what it was today. And that was the prize. If there was one there, sometimes there was no equity. They just bought the house. And I missed the point that they're not passing away today. But we're talking about can, the future. Can you, can you role play that, Dave, really quick? Let's just pretend like um, you're talking to Mark and I. Can you just show us what it looks like to get the equity now and then to oh, walk us down that? Pressure. <laughs> um, uh, um, you know, so I, I see uh, Miranda and Mark that uh, your mortgage is seven or say $125,000. Um, is that, is that right? I, and I make sure that I have the number correct. And um and if you were to sell the home, uh, Mark, Miranda, um, today, uh, what do you think that uh, you'd be able to, to sell the home for? You owe 150,000, would, would it sell for 150? Do you owe close to what, you, what the value of the home is? Do you have equity in the home? And, and they just kind of tell me what they have. So we, let's pretend like it's not, like we just bought it, so there's no equity really right now. No yeah. problem. Yeah. That's, and, that, and that's okay, Moran and Mark, you know, we're not, you're not, we're not passing away, you know, it's not our time, you know, thank God now. Uh, so, you know, we're going to, you know, when I pass away, you know, uh, you know, I'm hoping it'll be 75, 80, 85, 90. And in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the equity that I have today and the equity that you have today will, will grow. So you may not have equity today. Um, but five years, and I'll, and I'll talk to them about uh, the home value going up, and, um, and, uh, and it's important that they buy into that conversation. So again, I'm not telling them we're having a conversation about home value over time, and that typically uh, a home value goes up and our mortgage goes down, because mm -hmm. we're going to, so John and Mary are going to pay off the house in the next 10 years. So then I'll, I'll give a, uh, an example of what that equity will be. So now your mortgage is 150,000. So let's say hypothetically, you know, 15 years ago, you know, it's your day, John. And, uh, and, and let's say that you owe 70,000. 
So we have um, $80,000 of equity. And, um, and that's, the, that's the golden ticket. I don't call it a golden ticket, but that's the purpose of the plan. And I'll often tell a story. So John had mentioned about storytelling and Mark talked about storytelling. Um, in the beginning in my career, I was amazed at these folks that could tell stories about you know, these subjects. Be patient with yourself, you're gonna develop stories. Um, but I would often tell a story here about the equity and then, and then what the family did with the equity. So when the husband passed away, the wife was able to take that 80,000 of equity and then use that for the next step. And the next step was she, she wanted to get a small apartment mm -hmm. or, or a condo by her family. She wanted to move closer to family and her kids wanted her to move close to the family. And so I'll tell a story and, 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 and she, as I'm talking, she's placing herself in that scenario in the future and she's just really recognizing the importance of uh, what we're talking about. And, and, and we talked about the... Um, uh, Can I pause you what there one sec, Dave? Because I want to make sure that we draw a really important correlation. Um, when we were prepping for this call, Dave said that the, one of the most important things is them understanding what that equity is, yeah. right? So we started at zero, but he said it's really important that Mark and I evaluate our property in five years and in 10 years. So it might be good, and, and Dave's going into the stories, which ties in with that, but pause for a moment and say in five years from now, Mark, if your home right now is worth 150, what do you think it's going to be worth in five years? Yep, right. A think? Asking them. So again, yes. you're, you're, yes. not, you're not telling them what it's going to be worth. It, it, what you think isn't important. Mm -hmm. What they think is going to be important. You're going to help them think through all the details so they can make a good you know, a good judgment on it. Um, but when, when they tell you what that, uh, mor what that mortgage is, but you want to get an agreeable number from both husband and wife. So it's important that as a salesperson, we slow down, you know, we're nervous when we're new, but you want to make sure that we get a little micro commitment from both that they both feel that they would have 20,000 of equity. Or I, I want to, I want to make it sure because I, I, we saw a couple of questions in the sidebar. So Mark, in five years from now, what is the home going to be worth? Do you think it's, so it's worth 150 now, five years from now, you know, it might be worth uh, 170. Okay. And so if you owe 150 now in five years, what are you going to owe on the mortgage? Because that's going to go down, right? But your equity is going to go up. Yeah. Mortgage is going to go down proper. I'm going to make some improvements. I plan on fixing the AC, you know, doing stuff to the roof. So yeah, I'll probably, you know, have maybe 25, $30,000 in the home then. So okay. Boom. So they're seeing that. So in 10 years from now, what do you think that you think it could be double that? Or what do you, where do you kind of think there as time goes by? Right. And we paid off the house. We're paying down the home. Mm -hmm. so and so in a perfect world, I would draw it out, but like, I don't, I know on zoom, we can't always do that, but I think, you know, and now we can tie in a story, but just, just having them, you don't need to know numbers. I'm not a numbers guy. I can't do numbers like John Ziller can do it and Mark in their head. I don't. So I would just got really good at asking things to people and writing down what they tell me. And then all of my strategy was I read back what they tell me. And I say, do you guys agree with that? <laughs> and they say, yep. And that was my sales presentation, you know, but and Dave, you know, you're talking about adding in third part party stories like this is all really the icing on the cake to plant a seed for what you want them to agree with. So Dave, I know you're masterful at this and, and I know that's where you're going with this final part of this part here is, is now he's going to start telling a story that is going to draw them into that equity protection picture. And say, he says, most people do this. 90% of the folks that I work with in this group, like, do this and then he'll just he'll go through this story right and and he and dave you said this earlier most people like when you work with people they want to be like most people right and yeah they, they want to follow the experts you know if i yep. have a, if i have a heating and air guy at my house talking about furnaces or air conditioners um, i'm not an expert at air conditioners i couldn't tell you mm -hmm. which one is the best for me so when that advisor i know he's a salesperson but he's also the advisor um, I have a need, but if he says, this is what I own, Dave, you know, based on your home and the things we talked about, Dave, what I have is this, and most people in your situation do this, guess what Dave's going to do, 
okay? Because he he helped me understand what the work, because I, I live in my own little head. I don't know what to do. I need, I need a leader. I need a leader. I need somebody that's going to guide me to the best decision, that's confident, um, and, and, and all of that. So, and, and we awesome. talk a lot of, we talk a lot about posture and all, and that's kind of like the posture thing, right? Go ahead, John, you were going to. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just I love this, right? And, and what, what you're saying is facts tell, stories sell. Yeah. Right? And so we have to understand that, guys. And like, when you tell them what their home is going to be worth, like, if, if Carl taught me this, like, if, if you say it, it's subject to doubt. But if they say it, there's an undeniable fact to it. And so it's exactly what Miranda was talking about is just write it down and then just regurgitate back to them exactly what they said. Keep this in mind, okay? Just just one last comment, Dave, and I'll kick it back to you, is that um, people will buy because they like you, trust you, and understand how you are going to make an impact in their future. And so what Dave is just talking about was the purpose behind the plan. The purpose behind the plan will give them the ability to understand. And if they understand what they can do with that equity, it puts peace of mind and it's a clear vision and it's not this, this chaos, right? So if there's 70 or $80,000 in equity, he just told the story and boom, exact same thing, right? It's like, look, and then we're obtaining our goal with keeping a roof over Betty's head. Um, you know, take that equity turnaround. He bought a condo free and clear and he obtained the goal by keeping a roof over his wife's head. That's, that's what a lot of our clients do. I mean, do you guys see that same thing for yourselves? Oh yeah. my God, yes, absolutely love it. Boom, now you got an, an additional commitment toward the plan and, and you're perfect. Sorry, Dave, I'll, I'll keep going. That's good. Yeah, a lot of the seniors, they, they have so much debt and, and for two of them when it's both of them. And, and I've helped families where I want to encourage them to sell their house now and downsize now while you're healthy you know, to not keep your home uh, type thing. And I've had that conversation with them that if I were them, this is what I would, you know, suggest. Um, so just going on with the questioning, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, I, I throw out percentages based on my own experience of people that I help, but 90% of uh, seniors with my experience, when their spouse passes away, they, they choose not to live in the home long term. And, and then I give a story about myself and my wife that my wife told, you know, I asked her, you know, honey, God forbid I passed away last week, you know, I'm 53 years old. Would you want to stay in this big home, you know, by yourself with the maintenance and things like that? And my wife, she literally a second, no, you know, probably not. And so, so what I have is what I call a critical period. It's that first period. And I talk about what that is. Um, but I, so now I'm setting up the sale by letting them know about my wife, uh, our conversation, and, and then the reasons behind it, the logic behind the reason. And the logic, you know, what I wrote down was just a few. You know, first of all, uh, it's just the uh, loss of income, certainly, you know, so my, my wife would, it would be really heavy to lose my income, and it would be hard for her to, to maintain the home, so that's one. Um, if I was older, um, and we could suggest to them that, you know, social security, again, maybe telling a story uh, or about social security when a spouse passes away, uh, the surviving spouse receives the, the higher social security of the peer and, and, and doing that in your fact finding, right? And what that looks like. Another reason uh, my wife wouldn't want to stay in our home is the overall expenses. John had mentioned it, the mechanics, uh, air conditioner costs three, $4,000 a window leaks. It's a th everything's a thousand bucks, you know, if something goes wrong. Um, you know, in, in Chicago, we're shoveling snow or, or mowing the lawn. So I, I, I talk about the, the overall expenses uh, and the upkeep for the home. Just maintaining a home is stressful. And then, and then finally, health. You know, as we get older, um, you know, it's hard to care for a home and, and it's hard to care for ourselves as we get older. And, um, and, and I, and I, try to paint a little picture, not of right now, but five or 10 or 15 years from now, if the, if the spouse were to pass away, um, what that would look like if we have health issues, especially if they have health issues right now. So if I'm talking to somebody about a critical period thing and they're younger, well, their life expectancy probably isn't what it would be had they not had that health issue. And, and we, we talk about, um, you know, the spouse uh, perhaps not wanting to, uh, uh, keep the home just because of the the uh, maintenance 
or being able to take care of ourselves as we get older. Like my kids will probably not let me live alone because they'll want to make sure I'm being taken care of. So I, I talked about um, what life would be like um, and, and, and I'm having a conversation with them. And I tell a story, I tell stories about uh, my family and my wife and what, and then again, the logic behind it, just like the guy that comes and sells, talks to me about an air conditioner. Um, it's what it is, what it is, and then why, you know, what, and, and what most people do and the why. And I, and I'm, I just really appreciate an expert an ex, a continent expert. I appreciate whether they're selling me a car, a home, carpeting, it doesn't matter. Um, I put a lot of value in an expert if they present themselves as an expert. Dave, one of the things you said earlier, so you're going to, you're going to plant all these seeds about what life would look like for them. You do it with your own story. You can use a third party story and then wrap it back around and say, would you guys want to do that? Would you want to stay sure, yeah. in the home or whatever? So you've already like painted this big glamorous picture on what life looks like and then you wrap it up with what? Can you just share that with everyone? Uh, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, if it's a good tender conversation, they're agreeing with me and they're nodding their heads and they're, it's just mm -hmm. apparent that they really appreciate um, my painting the picture. But would you, you know, you know, uh, what does that look like for you, Mary? Uh, if, if John were to pass away, say last week, would you want to stay in this, this large home, this beautiful home, you know, by yourself for these reasons? And, and then uh, uh, see, so that's what we would call a trial close, right? We would ask her if, if uh, she would want to stay in the home based on what we talked about. And she would say, well, probably not. Because you know, you've just painted this huge picture for them. They're probably not going to say, no, I love this, whatever. So you've kind of like helped them make that decision. Uh, who wants to live alone in a big home with maintenance and stress and money? You know, mm -hmm. and, and it, but we have to put them there. You know, we have to put them there and, and tell the story of, of what that was like. You know, people, awesome. people often get depressed, you know, in that same home, staring at walls. And you'll hear stories of people passing away, you know, kind of shortly after, you know, their spouse, you know. So a lot of people want to, you know, so so then I, I'll talk about, um, you know, the first year after our soulmate passes. I talk about um, the grieving process. I think it's important for everybody to become a student of the grieving process and what psychologists say. So maybe this weekend, Google what psychologists say about the grieving process and what we go through. So as a new agent here at Symmetry, I had no idea what people went. I never lost a spouse. So mm -hmm. I didn't know, you know, so really understanding that so I can communicate that as to what, uh, 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 you know, depression, worry, and then bad decisions. So bad decisions. So now we're going into the equity protection and all of their stuff. Um, and Miranda, you know, you're the, you know, the, where I learned all of that. So Miranda tells a story of a, of a doctor who had millions of dollars in the bank. And, uh, and, and I personally um, have helped many people. And I tell them the story about uh, the multimillionaire, uh, and several of them that I help with a, uh, a, a small mortgage protection program and we call it, so it's more, it's critical period and it's equity protection. So we're tying, we're tying in their equity. We know what their equity is going to be. And then we're going to talk about um, the, the grieving process and making poor decisions. And it's very important to make a plan so that that nest egg that they have, the millions of dollars that they have and the, that $500,000 life insurance that they have it, so that was a nest egg that he wants her to have for years to have a great lifestyle like they had together. And, and so we talk about um, that, 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 that we need time to plan. So there's a grieving process, we can go into depression, et cetera. Then there comes a time when we're ready to sell the home, to call a realtor, to have the uh, home appraised, to set a price. Setting a price for the home is a very big decision. If, if she's not in her right mind, she may sell the house at a lower offer and lose a lot of her equity. So it's important that time has passed after the passing, they set the price, and then enough time passes so that she's able to be patient to get the full retail value of the home. Low ball offers are going to often come the first week, second week, and if someone's not in their right mind, they can have a tendency uh, to 
uh, sell the home at a loss and give up that nest egg, that equity. Again, we're tying it back in the conversation and the fact finding the importance of, of that equity. So uh, go ahead. I know we've got a, I know we're way over um, and I love where you're going, Dave, on this. Um, I think we could probably talk on that one point for, 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 the whole, for an hour, <laughs> that whole one. And then um, at the end, it's just asking questions about with all of that being said, or with that being said, um, and then I'll ask questions about their thinking on the conversation and I'll get buy-in. Um, and that's the, the micro commitments that we talk about that they agree and they, 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 they understand and they agree with, with what we're talking about. And they, they see it's very important. Again, it's, and, and so we'll do little policies. It might be a $12,000 policy, which would equal one year of mortgage payments, um, a year and a half of mortgage payments, and the purpose of the policy, again, is so that the family can, the, the person can grieve properly. They can have a plan to get all the equity out of the home. I'll turn it over to you, Miranda. <laughs> no, I love it. I feel like we probably need like an hour for like each part of this, um, the equity protection and the, the other part too. But um, Mark, I know that um, we're way over. Um, I thought this was really, really awesome. We've got like about a hundred questions in the in the question and answer box. Um, and I know that we're not gonna be able to get to them all. But um, Mark, I know that you had a couple on your heart that you wanted to make sure that we, we, I know some of you guys may have to pop off, but Mark, I know you wanted to get to those. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> there's one specifically that really hit, hit home with me because when I was new in the field, one of the first things that I ran into that handcuffed me was someone that said, I have work coverage. You know, I have two times my salary through work or someone that said, you know, I already have a policy. And, and so um, I like to handle uh, objections before they come up. And so what I learned, and I really picked this up from a recording I listened to from um, uh, Rex Knight Jr., um, you know, two and a half years ago, and he called it naming that puppy. And it just sticks in my head, Rex. I love you, man. You got to name that puppy. What he was saying is you got to give that insurance purpose. Mm -hmm. So quick role play, how I, I would do that. And I would do it proactively. I try to do it before I get into my fact find so that the insurance is already um, has a purpose. So someone, so what I would set up as my questioning is I say outside of work-based coverage, do you have any life insurance that you own? And I'll exclude work-based coverage intentionally. And that'll go down one of two paths, right? Uh, one of three, no. Okay, that's the easy one. Um, they'll say, yes, I have a small policy, final expense. Um, and I'll just simply say, oh, so that's to cover your final expenses when your, your time passes. Is that, does that sound right? Yes. Oh, great. That's why people get mortgage protection separately because a single policy can't do both. Does that make sense? Yes. Just put that in a jar, right? The next one might be, oh, I've got, you know, a quarter million dollars. I got half a million dollars. Okay, great. Congratulations on that. You obviously care deeply about your family. Um, what was the, when did you get that coverage out and what was the purpose? like most people was that to replace your income. And I'm, I'm going fast through this here for sake of time, but like most people was that to replace your income. So God forbid if something happened to you, you were able to provide income to your family so they're able to maintain their lifestyle. And the, the answer when you lead, I call it leading the witness that way, you lead them a little pause and you fill in that blank for them, they say yes. And so now you've given that insurance purpose. What if they say, I, no, I have it all through work. I have work-based based coverage. I go, well, that coverage actually is not yours. It's not something that you own. It's actually something that your employer owns. What you have as a certificate, they're the ones that have the policy. And so God forbid that you're not working there anymore, that coverage ends and you end up with very little to nothing. And most people are gonna have their uh, home, they're gonna have the roof over their head longer than their job. So when it comes to protecting their lifestyle and their homestead, they want something that they own and they control. Does that make sense? Yes. And that line of questioning and thinking isolates people having existing coverage. And it's been very, very effective for me for the last few years. That's awesome. Well, there's a bunch in here, guys. We're not going to get to these questions. Um, I'm sure we'll be back at some point in the future. Um, and I am I know that Todd looks through all of these. So we can, is there anything else you guys want to add as we kind of wrap everything up here? Awesome job, you guys. I think there was a ton here. This would be worth a transcription for sure. Um, I know that's where a lot of our stuff comes from. So, <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Again, awesome stuff, Dave, Mark, Murr, as per usual, you are amazing. You know, again, just looking at one of the things here is like, 
I, I think, you know, we, we all get dealt with that in the very beginning, kind of that decision today thing. Um, one of the things I would just encourage is that I think, you know, symmetry, you know, Brandon, Brandon Casey did a really good job at just getting out in front of that, um, you know, up front. And so I, I would never encourage anyone try to become an expert at overcoming objections. Um, become an expert presenter. Um, because if you find yourself becoming an expert at overcoming objections, you're going to constantly deal with that over and over and over again. And you're just really good at handling it. And you don't want to do that. It's all about the presentation um, and really getting out in front of the best way to overcome an objection, right? Is just handling it before it ever even comes up. So just kind of keep that in mind. You don't want to be an expert at overcoming objections. You want to be an expert presenter, which is getting out in front of all that stuff before it comes up. Mm -hmm. So that's one and of the things I would say there, Mer. And I'm seeing a lot of things in the, the chat bar about light bulbs. Like that's one thing that I really want you guys to think about is what did really turned on a light bulb for you today? Maybe post that on your group me string. Um, I know for me, like drawing that correlation between income and like that $500 life insurance policy, that that doesn't last a long time if you just divide their income into it. Um, also, the uh, luxury versus necessity stuff. Like the, these are things that change the game where I went from writing average size policies to, I remember one was a $12,000 APV after I started implementing some of this stuff. So awesome guys. Thank you so much for, for um, all of you guys that stayed on and Dave, Mark, uh, John, thank you guys so much. And we will see you next time. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye. Thanks.